You're listening to Atlanta Baseball Talk, your weekly podcast for all things Atlanta Braves. Welcome to show number 310. Wow, 310. That seems like wow. a lot of shows. Uh, <laughs> today is Sunday, August 9th. I am Kurt, no Steve again, but I am joined by Hamilton. So, Ham, let's get to it. All right. Tonight we'll discuss uh, Markakis and AJ basically carrying the offense, our memories of the 95 World Series 20 years ago. That also seems insane. Um, and the state of Williams Perez. But first, another trade. Um, and this one, I honestly, we might not find anyone that objects to it. Um, the Braves, <laughs> after seemingly two years, have finally shed uh, Chris Johnson. They were trially able to meet his trade demands, um, and they got rid of him and his bloated contract and his inability to hit righties and his attitude and dumped him on the Indians for our old friend Michael Bourne, um, Nick Swisher, and his infectious energy and $10 million in cash. So, Ham, first impressions. Uh, I, mine are that you showed yourself of, obviously, one unproductive veteran and his bad contract for two, albeit uh, shorter contracts. But Born and Swisher, they come off the books after 2016, and Chris Johnson obviously was signed through 2017. So, to me, it's a win well, straight they, off the bat. They come off the if, – if neither of them gets a lot of plate appearances, they have vesting options for 2017, which, I'm, which the Braves essentially control just by – giving them at bat. So yes, you know, I, I agree. I mean, I texted Steve, he texted me this trade and I responded to him, Steve, wake up your dream texting. Cause I think this is, this is the best. I mean, otherwise we would have to DFA Chris Johnson. There was no way we were getting rid of him. And I actually think, um, you know, first of all, it's good that Chris Johnson's not a brave anymore. I mean, there were glimmers of him being able to produce, but overall he was below average everywhere in the field, at the plate his attitude was bad for the team and and i think it's a good for him that he gets a fresh start and i think it's good for the braves that he's gone and i think it's a two for one i mean we got we, you know you kurt you talked about when Aribe and johnson left that the veteran leadership was leaving and obviously that was compounded when we lost jim johnson and others and Grilly with the injuries so we bring two veterans back um I mean, I think Swisher has underperformed this year, uh, but he's got a good clubhouse presence. You know, he had double knee surgery a year ago, and the doctor told him you'll start to feel better in a year. And according to him, he's starting to feel better. So who knows? Maybe we get a little uptick from him. We certainly did in his first game as a Brave. Um, and I think it's good. I mean, I think it's a, it's a no-lose situation. I think it also, uh, especially, you know, Chris Johnson didn't cost us a game against the Giants this week with his boneheaded play when he thought there were two outs and there were only one against the Giants, but he was providing no value. And I think Swisher can provide a little bit more value as a backup to Freddie at first. So I think we won this trade if there were any winners to be had. But I think the the you know the Indians won too. They got what they wanted. We got what we wanted. Yeah, and and Chris Johnson, uh, you know, like went four and four his first game for the Indians, and good for him. You know, great, it's great. If 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 it changes scenery is what that guy needed, God bless and and let's move on. And I think what we're gonna get you you mentioned it, and we saw it the very first night. We saw it last night. Is their energy? Uh, Michael Bourne was considered by all a great presence in the clubhouse, a great teammate. Um, Joe Simpson, of course, was saying, "Oh, we you know he never should have left." The Braves in the first place. Well, the reason he left the Braves in the first place was because the Indians offered him nearly fifty million dollars to come and play <laughs> for them. Um, but it's the the positivity that that Swisher brings. I mean, it's 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 great. It's fun. I mean, and the Braves have kind of attached themselves to. I keep saying mascot type of guys, and I, I don't mean that in a derogatory fashion. But I mean these guys that are these rah rah guys, which you need those types of guys. I mean you're going to be down, especially at this time of year, if you're not really competing for much. And and to have the energy like that with Hinsky guys like Gomes, you know, I mean they've they've really kind of picked up a lot of these types of characters to fill the need. Um, that perhaps, and I keep saying this, that perhaps that uh, that Freddie does not provide. It's like they right. have to fill this gap 
and, and bring these guys in. Um, they've both been all-stars. They've both been productive in their careers. You mentioned Swisher and his knees in the year. Um, he, w- he had a, a rehab stint in the minors where he batted 317. So he seemed like he's, you know, feeling good. And there, and he was super excited to be coming to the Braves. I mean, you know, it's, it's not often that you get two guys who have been – uh, around the block and get traded late in the year and get traded to a team that's basically in the same situation that their other team is. I mean, record wise, the Indians are completely buried in the AL uh, Central, but, um, you know, they, I think they've got two fewer losses than the Braves do. So it's not like they're yeah. moving up into the playoff scenario, but they both seem very genuinely excited about coming back to Atlanta. Um, you mentioned um, Swisher, obviously, is going to be playing first with Freeman out, but he can be a backup. And Bourne can play left. He can back up Maven in center. And, uh, you know, once again, we're pointing every finger toward 2017. So, yeah. I mean, you sort of wish, I mean, the way, it's so true, but, and you sort of wish that uh, there were younger guys, you know, other than Jace Peterson, maybe Yuri Perez. You know, I don't think see a lot of rookies on the team right now who are like, those guys are going to be cornerstones of the 2017 lineup. You right. know, I mean, obviously Simmons and Freeman and those guys are. And, Hopefully Marcakis, but you wish there were some some rookies who we had who could who could learn, you know, from Swisher and from Bourne, who we would benefit from having those guys here now, so that in two years they would, you know, be able to to take advantage of that. But it's still, I mean, it it makes it fun to watch, and I think it, um, you know, for the some of the rookies that we do have, uh, it's good to have those guys here, and even Simmons and and some of the, you know, Peterson. It's good for those guys to be around winners, right? And people, veterans who who have seen a lot. Yeah, so. I mean, Swisher's got a World Series ring, um, but that's a good point. I mean, you know, Garcia, Yuri Perez, those guys are not young by any stretch of the imagination. They're both thirty-ish. I mean, I yeah. know Garcia is. I don't know exactly how old Yuri Perez is, but a little bit younger, twenty-seven, yeah. something like that. But yeah, I mean, it's it's not like there's there's a ton of really young guys on this team to be part of that. Maybe the bullpen, but they're not going to suck up as much of it being out there. So, how about things not to like about this trade? I mean, I guess the only thing not to like is is Swisher's health, right? I think uh, Johnson was a little bit more durable, a little bit younger. Um, I mean, it's funny. It's it you. This is all based on pretending you're playing for something this year, right? I mean, I think Johnson, you know, if Swisher goes down and if his knees don't hold up, we we really have no backup at first, um, unless we're just really just you know putting Turdo or Cunningham there or somebody. I don't know, um, but other than that, I don't I don't see a lot of downside of this trade. I really see very little downside of this trade. Maybe I guess the only other thing is. I don't see this happening, but you know, you, you you end up being on the hook for that vested option on either one of those guys because something happens next year where they get their at bats or their plate appearances. You know, I I don't see that happening, but maybe that's a downside. I really, it's it seems truly like a, a win win for both the Indians and the Braves. Yeah, I mean, there's been a precipitous drop in what these guys were once. Um, you know, basically we. Not that they're comparable talent-wise, but we basically just took on the Ugla and B.J. Upton contracts from the Indians. Um, They had both signed these guys for long-term contracts, and they both basically went there and got hurt and didn't produce at all. Um, Swisher's deal was 65 for four seasons, and his war value has been one and a half since he's been there. Bournes was 48 over four years, and his war was 3.7, which is – which is pretty good, but then you look at his that he had a six point one WAR his last year with the Braves. So um, his own base percentage, Bournes is is three thirteen, which obviously Freddie's going to bat him lead off a lot. So this is why we just got rid of Peraza is because he does not get on base as right. a single hitter, and that's exactly what Michael Bourne is. He does not walk a lot, and Swisher is batting one ninety eight. So. Um, but you hope that, like, there's been a bunch of these guys that have come in. Um, I mean, Kelly Johnson has was having a terrible go of it the past couple of years and, and had a great season enough that somebody actually traded for the guy. So Bourne can certainly come back and do the same thing. He clearly enjoyed his time in Atlanta. You hope that that's an impact. And Swisher is, just seems very excited talking about that a team wants him. Um, not maybe that Cleveland didn't want him, but, you know, they were willing to give up his contract. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I guess the age and if they don't 
do anything and they're just holding up spots that maybe could be filled by somebody younger and cheaper. What's the loss though? Yeah, I mean, I mean, totally. yeah. Absolutely. So do you think that the guys on the TV were going on and on about um, what they can contribute? We just talked about it some, but do you agree that the team is better with Bourne over Yuri and left and Swisher, obviously starting now with Freddie Hurt, but better on the bench over Cunningham or Turto? No and yes. I think I don't think that – I hope that Bourne doesn't get more starts than Yuri. Uh, I, I see no future for Bourne as a brave uh, long term. And I see maybe some. You, you mentioned that Yuri's a little bit older, but he's having a better season. He's hitting 288. Bourne's only at 243. Um, you know, Bourne has 13 stolen bases, but he's played a lot more games, had a lot more plate appearances. So I, I hope that – I hope Bourne is not taking starts from Yuri. Uh, but I am happy that Swisher is is a better option than Turdo or Cunningham off the bench, and I think that uh, he's he's a veteran. He's seen a lot of these pitchers. He just has seen a lot more pitches in general in his in his career. Hopefully, his knees are healthy. So I I definitely think he's a better boon off the bench, and I think Bourne is too as a pinch runner, as someone coming in late. Uh, you wish he walked more, uh, but I think both those guys off the bench and as spot starters. Um, are great. I don't want either one of them really starting that much. Yeah, and Yuri, with Yuri, I, I totally agree with you on as- that aspect. He does not, I mean, it's all singles. Um, he's only got four extra base hits the entire year and 111 at bat. So that's, you know, that is what it is. And as a pinch hitter, he's not so much. They've really not given him many opportunities, but that might be because that's not really his forte. He's only one for five as a pinch hitter this year. Um, while he is batting 292 in the eighth spot, which is probably the best place for him to hit. And right. he's obviously thriving there. Um, as far as the two guys with, with behind Swisher with Cunningham or Turto coming off the bench, I mean, you know, Cunningham's catch on Saturday night was great. And you have that aspect of it, that he is a, a good defensive player, but uh, you know, neither one of these guys can really hit all that much right now. Um, so I don't. I think I'm with you on Swisher over them as well. So, um, okay, quick lightning round. Yep. Um, on a scale of one to ten, ten being the most likely, Swisher is on the 2016 opening day roster. Two. Yeah, I have a three and a half, but I was very low on that one. I think if anybody's going to be gone, it's going to be him because he seems more replaceable. I guess. Uh, same question, 1 to 10, Born is on the 2016 opening day roster. See, I think I'm different than you. I say zero on Born. I just don't see the point of having him on the team. I guess, you know, why not, right? If it's his last year, we're already on the hook for paying him. We're not – I do not want him to get his whatever number of plate appearance to vest for 2017. You know, maybe he has a nice audition here in, in this these last couple of months and, and somebody wants to pick him up. I, I just don't see the point of having him on the team with an eye towards 2017. So I'm at zero. I really don't think he'll be here. I think the Braves will try to move him. Yeah, I went a little higher. Well, significantly higher, given that you said a zero. Um, <laughs> I went six and a half. And I think it's just because they're going to use him in all the positions in the outfield. He can back up Marquecas. He can back up Maven, assuming Maven is still around. Potentially Maven is the trade piece now. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I think that they really do like him. I think they're very excited to have him back as a Brave. So I think he has a very good chance of hanging around. But I just hope they don't – I mean, he. I don't know what the play – I mean, I guess it's probably – a number of plate appearances is commiserate with being a starting or an everyday center fielder. Maybe it would be a disaster because oh, then yeah. we'd owe him 17 million. Right. Yeah, so I maybe. want him to be a utility guy. Uh, but I think that he's, he would have more value as us as if we could convince someone to, to take him off our hands. Maybe yeah. at 17 million. That's a pretty, well, maybe if hefty he has price. a good, good first half next year, he can be a trade deadline player. True. So moving on um, the offense, has not been all that great. They did pick it up quite a bit this week, but we didn't have not really talked about the contributions. Speaking of veteran presence on this team, Marcakis and AJ are basically carrying this offense. It's so so true. let's talk about that just very quickly because it's really been quite remarkable. Yeah, well, the big shame is that it's all for naught, right? If you look at both of them, they're having sort of career years offensively, and not not the best year of their lives, but certainly. Top five, take away the power from Marcakis, which 
somebody did. Um, you know, this season, Mark Hakis has been great. He's got uh, his average is high. He's getting on base a lot. Uh, you know, other when, than when he was batting fifth, he's hit over 300 at every slot in the lineup, wherever Freddie has put him. Uh, he's done it all. And AJ is he's our offensive MVP. You know, Freddie had all the numbers and everything until he got injured. But if you're looking at it over the, the course of the season, I think he's our best player. And I just think it's a shame that these two guys are, are, are really, you know, you, when you think about, you have your all stars, you have your young rookies and these veterans come and you hope to fill the gap. And, and if these guys were having better, the type of years they're having on just an average offensive team, right? We had a couple all stars who were playing every day and some young guys who were, producing and up and coming the Braves offense would be unstoppable right but unfortunately it's all for naught with both these guys but it's amazing it's really something yeah and they of course ironically as as often the case we choose to highlight guys in the day that we choose to highlight them they both when they both lose their hitting streaks yeah, right yeah <laughs> um but uh, yeah I mean you know, Mark Hake is going in today, had the, the longest hitting streak in the National League. And, of course, he came up in a huge position today when he could have tied the game and flied out to right field, but almost got it over Ichiro's head. If he had just kind of flattened that ball out a little more, I think that scores two and we're tied and who knows what happens. But he hit 379 over that streak. He hadn't struck out all week long. And, of course, he strikes out twice today. Um, but, yeah, you're right about AJ. I mean, it's it continues. I mean, it, it seems like he had one bad month, but it's just been uh, – something to behold other than that. And during this, this 12 game streak, he was just on, he hit 426, which crazy. It's pretty amazing. And you got to consider that the, the void that's created with Freeman, not being in there with, with Kelly Johnson and Juan Uribe lose, lost off this team again, to Steve's point, pointing out how bad the offense on this team can be at times. It's pretty amazing that um, they've scored any runs, and it's really contributable to these guys so much. You want Przinsky back next year? Yeah, sure, absolutely. I mean, especially if you've got this young pitching that's that we're going to be riding. Yeah, I mean, that's the other thing is that you know I know some. I mean, there's been a lot of lumps in the road, but he's done a pretty good job bringing these guys on board as well. You know, I mean, he's really done an amazing job. Well, and I was reading a quote, and I I I won't say it verbatim, but they were asking Tehran about. Um, Brzezinski and he was like, yeah, he can be mean, which, you know, I've got kids, you've got kids. Sometimes you got to be mean with kids. Sometimes yeah. you got to get a, the way you get a point across to them is, is you, you, you know, it's not all balloons and rainbows. Sometimes you got to get up their butts a little and, and that's might be what some of these guys need. So yeah. Talking about getting up butts. Um, I don't know. I'm trying to say. Let's, let's here. stop talking. About, yes. Let's stop talking about that. <laughs> so really the greatest moment in Braves history was celebrate the 20th anniversary, which just, Ooh. again, that seems astonishing. Um, yeah. They celebrated the 20th anniversary of the 95 World Series championship team. Um Saturday night. And it was awesome to see so many of those guys back. I mean, obviously, uh, I think it's Greg McMichael is the one that's in charge of getting all the alums back and just to see so many of those players. And honestly, I had forgotten, like Steve Avery was still in the 95 team. I had forgotten a lot of the guys that were still on that team. But um, what's your uh, what's your favorite memories of that year? Uh, so first of all, um, I'd like to give a little shout out. It's the 50th anniversary of the Braves being in Atlanta also and the 125th anniversary of the Braves as a franchise. So those are two okay stats, Longest I guess. Longest operating franchise in baseball. That's right. Woo. Um, so, you know, I think about – there's a couple of things I think about the postseason uh, – about, about the season in general. Um, first of all, it's memorable because we we got Marquise Grissom in the offseason um, as our starting center fielder. And in such a short – run with the Braves. He was my, I think he was one of my favorite Braves. I just loved Marquise Christum. So that was for Roberto Kelly. I know it was such a steal. Um, you know, that was the Uber season from Maddox. It's when he won 19 games and had a 1.63 ERA and won the Cy Young. I mean, I always loved Maddox, but that was the season. I think that transcended all of the other Maddox seasons for me. Um, and then one more thing, you know, about the season is we just crushed the NL East. So the gap between the second and fifth place teams, which at the times the Mets, the Phillies, the Marlins, and the Expos, was only two and a half games. So between second place and last place, the spread was two and a half games. The spread between the Braves and the Mets and Phillies, who tied for second, was twenty-one games. So um, 
we just destroyed the East. And, um, you know, two other things that stick out to me. First of all, I feel like that was our, I feel like that was our best offensive lineup. In a lot of ways, that was our most iconic lineup. Like if you were to say to me, name the 90s Braves lineup, it would be, and here it is, Blouser, Grissom, Chipper, Justice, Klesko, Lemke, Javi, and Crime Dog. Right, so you know, a tip of the cap to Gant, a tip of the cap to Galarraga, some others, but that's the Braves of the '90s for me. That lineup right there, and it all came together in that postseason. We homered in every game, so our power was on a uh, on effect there, and then all capped off by Glavin's game six gem, which is you, know, you think about the Jack Morris John Smoltz game. I don't really remember the stats of that game. I remember it was awesome. But I remember Maddox or Glavin going eight innings, giving up one hit against the Indians. Obviously, Willers came in for the save. Um, I mean, that was that was the most iconic, dominant pitching performance in the postseason for the Braves. So I, I there's a lot that stands out for me for that season as well as for that postseason. What about you? Well, yeah, I mean, it's it is amazing. I'll talk about that that game six in a minute, but. You talk about the 21 game gap. I mean, the Braves started that season 20 and 17 and were in third place and then went on a run leading up to the All Star game where they won. They went 20 and five. So they started 20 and um, 17. So that means they go on. They finish with 90 wins. So they go 70 and 37 to close out the season, which is just insane. I mean, that is absolutely insane. And that's like, you know, when when they brought over McGriff and closed out uh, the year to catch the Giants. I mean, the the streaks that the Braves would go on, and it's because of the pitching. I mean, you had that starting pitching, and there were no days off for for other teams. And it might have helped that the East was really terrible, but – it's well, really the big three because Merker and Avery both had losing records. I mean, Avery was seven and ten, I think, that season, and Merker was not much better. But the other guys were all fifteen for, game for winners. my point. No, I'm just yes, um, yes. <laughs> but that was the first year that they had split into uh, three divisions, and they had the wild card. And amazingly, at the time, they decided that what would happen in the first round was that the the higher seed would go to the lower seed to play the first two games of the series. So it was at Colorado for two games, and then they came back to Atlanta for potentially the final three games, which, again, utterly stupid. Yeah, especially that team. Yeah, Well, utterly stupid, but and then you think about the Braves going to Colorado and the success they had there was almost unfair. Well, but, I mean, that was a, that, was that Bash Brothers the Colorado team with Bichette and Galarraga and those guys, Walker, Vinny yep. Castilla. And, but it just, I mean, it's just like having the all-star game decide the world series is that you send, send a team on the road for the first two games. And I remember getting a little stressed at the time thinking, why do they have to go on the road? But it's almost like they got through that. Then they destroyed the reds, uh, swept the reds. And then, you know, you look at that Cleveland team that had so much firepower and we end up out homering them in the World Series. They just get completely dominated by our pitching. I think mm-hmm. that I think I saw somewhere that their batting average, collective batting average for the where the World Series was less than one sixty. So we just totally shut them down. And I mean, I've said it a thousand times. Everybody that listens to this show knows that I was at Game Six when we beat the the <laughs> Indians. And really, they, yes, they were asking they were asking Glavin the other night about who got the hit off of him, and he he knew immediately. But I. I mean, if if he was it Eddie Murray? No, was it was. It? Um, I think it was. Oh God, no, I can't remember who was the second baseman. Oh, uh, Alomar. No, 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 no. no. Um, uh, I don't remember. Anyway, we'll waste yeah. time on it. Yep. Um, but uh, I mean, if he throws in, I mean, that game should be considered one of the greatest postseason games of all time, and I don't, I don't think it it falls anywhere in any anybody's pantheon of greatest postseason games. But I mean, if he throws a no hitter. It might be top two or three greatest. I mean, a no hitter to win the World Series. Yeah, well, especially after what the Braves had been through, right? I mean, I'm I'm totally with you 100. But even take it out of context, a one hitter, a no hitter in a world in a closing game for a World Series is great. But add to it that the Braves had been through so much and had been known as the choker, and they were getting the Buffalo Bills moniker or whatever, and he steps up and says it stops here in Atlanta tonight. And it was just 
I'm with you. I told that it goes. It's my pantheon as the greatest. It's one of the greatest postseason games ever. And, and I mean, it should it should go down. And I mean, I'm sorry. It's it's to win a World Series and you throw a one hitter. I mean, it should be considered. And maybe I just haven't heard enough baseball people talk about it. But and he was not a guy that was going to throw a lot of no hitters. You know, I mean, he he pitched a contact. So for him to do that on that night, it's pretty extraordinary. So okay. Uh, time for fair or foul. Uh, we throw something out there, and if you agree, it's fair, and if you disagree, it's foul. So, Ham, yes, two bad starts for Williams Perez in a row here. Um, so, fair or foul, between now and the end of the season, he figures it out and sets himself up to return to the rotation next season. Well, he's, he has uh, faced, he has a strong arm, he, and he's stayed strong, even to late innings. The other night, he was still throwing in the 90s into the 6th or 7th, so... Or however late he was, I know that he would, he got bashed a little early, and we have to get. I mean, over his last four starts, he's faced the Mets, the Pirates, the Phillies, and the Giants. So, I think you have to take that into account anyway. So, so I think fair, he will, he's going to figure it out. I think he's going to give himself a good shot at being in, in the rotation the next season, and I think we'll need him. Yeah, I'm I'm with you. I, I, and obviously the the Phillies game the, the, that's that was a very hot offensive team. They're still playing well, um, and the Giants always play well in Atlanta. So, I'm not sure you can totally hold those against him. I, I think that just like any rookie, he's gonna he's gonna hit a wall, and and we're gonna get some bad starts out of him the rest of the season. So I think that that's something we should just come to expect. Um, we've seen it a lot. We can look at my shot in the dark when we touch on that. And see that uh, you know some of these young guys are getting touched up a lot more right now. But I, 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 I regardless of what happens the rest of the season, he, he's in the rotation mix for next year. I mean, that's just there's just no way that that's not a possibility that's going to happen. So, right. Um, so fair or foul? In July, Jace Peterson's batting average OBP was one seventy four two forty eight Yurch. In August, <laughs> it's 345, 387. So, fair or foul, the rest of the way, his batting average will be over 270 and his OBP will be over 325. So, let me throw some Jekyll and Hyde uh, numbers at you for Jace. So, at home through the season, he's batted 277. Away, he's batted 224, which for the rest of the season would work in his favor as the Braves have more home games left than road games. So, that's a ball. And more home games than any other team in baseball. Yes. Uh, and somewhere Julio is smiling. Um, Tehran, that is. Um, uh, but, so he's got that form. But in when, in the, when the Braves wins, he bats 275. When he, they lose, he bats 224. I think there's going to be more losses than wins from here on out. So that's a strike against him. Um, you know, in limited stats, he, he actually is much better when he's in the bottom third of the lineup, especially at seventh. Um, where he's batting over 350. But so I think he's going to be at the top of the lineup a lot going down the stretch, which is a strike against him, I would say. Um, and if you look at who he's batted best against, it's been against the NL West, actually, than any other league. And I and uh, he's done okay against the Mets and the Phillies, but I still think we're going to have a lot of games here against the East down the stretch, which is a strike against him. So I'm going to say foul. I think he's not going to end the season over 270 or 325. Um, I'm going to go halvesies. Um, his batting average is kind of seesaws. 246, 282, 263, 174, 313. So I'm going to say that September he's going to bat in somewhere in the 250 range, which would put him obviously below the 270. His OBP has stayed a little more consistent than that. Um, so I'm going to say he goes a little over the 325. So fair on that one, around 335. So No halvesies. Havesies. I'm always about the Havesies. So no moving on, uh, right. we are off to the silver lining for the week. Uh, of course, we talk about something good that happened this week. Um, so what you got? What do I got? Well, even though we talked about him earlier, and even though his streak ended today, I, I got to go with Nick Markakis. Um, over the past seven days, he's hit 464 with two doubles, nine RBIs, which has been a, a significant chunk of the runs that the Braves have scored. Uh, I'd love to see a little more power, obviously, but uh, but I'll take it. 
Um, yeah, I there was quite a few guys. Uh, obviously, Markek is Przinsky. We talked about Jace Peterson had a pretty good week. Um, I went Vizcaino um, just because I like what he's doing as the closer of the future. He got one win this week. He pitched 2.2 innings, only gave up three hits, and had two saves. So he is my silver lining for the week. Nice. Um, next up, of course, is our favorite shot in the dark, our predictions for the coming week. Um, first, let's look back at last week. Uh, maybe we shouldn't. Um, <laughs> first up is our listener shot in the dark that came from Caleb Cabo. Calbo, sorry, Caleb, I'm I'm butchering your last name, who predicted that the Braves would hit at least one homer in each game. They started off great. They hit four homers in the first game against the Giants and then only hit homers in two of the remaining uh, six games. So close, but no cigars. Thank you, Caleb, for playing. We appreciate you chiming in. Um, And, of course, ring back in this week. So... Uh, Ham, let's check on our predictions for last week. Ham, I mocked you and even mocked Dude. you about how to say his name. Adonis and I was Garcia. right. Yes. You were. Two homers and eight Ks is what you had. Um, he only had four Ks, but he did hit two homers. And a big one, too. So that's pretty spot on. Yes, thank you. Steve rode the Shelby Miller train straight into the ground, as I did. He predicted that he would get two wins this week. The Braves went 0-2 in his two starts. He only had one loss, but again, he had no run support. They scored. He only gave up four earned runs, but they um, only scored one run or two runs while he was pitching. Ugh, um, poor guy. Yeah, he pitched. He pitched. He had the lead against the Giants, and then the bullpen completely imploded on him. And uh, they lost that game. So he will be back at it this week, and hopefully this winless streak will finally come to an end. I mentioned before that I went uh, with the young starters. Fulte, Perez, and Whistler had four starts this week. I predicted that they would go combine three and one and give up a total of eight earned runs. How'd that go? Yeah. Where's the trumpet sound? <laughs> they went one and two and gave up 18. Oh. <laughs> 18 earned runs. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Wow. Williams Perez, I think, gave up six in his start. So... Yeah. Not so much. Uh, so looking ahead for this. Oh, well, of course, Sam, you are the winner. You, you, get, off, you get off to a hot start in uh, September. August. August. Whatever. Thank you. Whatever. August. I'm jumping ahead. I'm ready for, I'm ready for Halloween. Um, so you lead the month 1-0. Nice. Uh, so looking ahead, Steve is on immediately on the Michael Bourne train. He has him hitting over 350 this week. So, Ham, what do you have? I'm going to be the anti-Steve this week, I think. I'm going Bourne hits under 200 this week. So the, I like Michael Bourne. I'm glad he's here, but I'm not so high on him just I'm yet. Gonna, I'm going to offer that you're the anti-Steve most weeks. Thank you. Yes. Um, I am going with a reverse jinx. So please note in your books when you write this down at home that this is a reverse jinx. <laughs> I don't want this to happen. Shelby, Hater. Shelby Miller does not get his win this week he gives up four earned runs and five innings pitched against wow. the d-backs so uh everybody out there get your uh shot in the darks in by game time on tuesday we have a weird five game schedule this week that starts on tuesday so make sure you get them in game time on tuesday and we will track them over the week and let you know how it goes so hey i'm looking back at our win loss records for last week's the last week's four three home stand steve and i both went three and four ham because you hate the braves you went two and five it's weird, though. You know, I think we've obviously made these predictions for a long time, but we, we haven't really tracked them until, I don't know, what, five or six weeks, maybe, Curtis? And it feels like we never get them right. I think it speaks to how unpredictable the Braves are. But I don't think anybody has actually nailed their – maybe once somebody has nailed their prediction for the one-loss record for the week, which uh, – Well, and it's a lot of a lot of average play. So when you – and when go, you get excited, you you know you're oh they're going to go five and one and they'll go you know three and four, yeah. And, or they oh, they're going to be terrible this week. They're going to go one and five and they'll go three and four, four. And three. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, speaking of <laughs> coming up, weird week. We've got five games this week. The Braves I don't think have have a game off in like two months. So they have two off this week. 
So we've got two games in Tampa and then three back home against Arizona. So Tuesday, we get Erasmo Ramirez, who is 8-4 and four with a 3.83 ERA. Um, he is 0-3 um, and has given up 14 runs, 11 earned in his last three starts. So he is on a little bit of a skid. He gets Williams Perez. So Wednesday, we have Jake Odorizzo which is nice with a nice white clam sauce. Um, <laughs> he's 6-6 six and six with a 277 ERA. Three of his losses, he's gotten Shelby Millard. He has only given up seven earned runs in three of his losses, so he has not had the best luck pitching. He gets Matt Whistler. Friday against the Snakes, we get Ron. Man, I hope Whistler just fits. I just get the ball over the plate. Just throw strikes, man. Yeah. Just throw strikes. Once again, a big week we need out of our three young starters. Yeah, yeah. Um, Robbie Ray for the, the Diamondbacks on Friday, who is 3-7 with a 3-13 ERA. So it sounds like he has not had much luck from his support either. He gets Tehran at home. Uh, Patrick Corbin, who is two and three with a 4.08 ERA, gets Fulty, who really did not look too bad in his last start, um, and then Ruby De La Rosa, who I loved her third jazz album. Um, <laughs> going nine, he's got nine and five with a 4.56 ERA against the aforementioned Shelby Miller. So Steve, riding high again, four and one. Ham, what do you got? <laughs> I have three and two. I think we go one and one and then two and one. Ditto. Nice. So, Am. That's that, the show. That's the show. Woo. Please make sure you have us in your RSS. Steve will be back, everybody. Steve will be back next week. <laughs> Ham and I might not be, but Steve yes. will definitely be back. You might be due for a Steve solo show. Yes. Uh, so please make sure you have us in your RSS feeds or, or subscriptions on iTunes or Stitcher so that you don't miss any of our weekly shows. As always, check us out at AtlantaBaseballTalk.com for past shows, to check out our blogs, and to post in our comments sections. And be sure to follow us on Twitter at ATL Baseball Talk and to like us on Facebook. We do have a YouTube page as well. So thanks for listening as always, and go Braves! Thanks for listening to Atlanta Baseball Talk, your weekly podcast for all things Atlanta Braves. To find new shows, to post in our forum, or to send a comment, please visit us at atlantabaseballtalk.com.